Thank you, Dr. Jelani, and thank you for having me. Um, so Dr. Jelani touched on some of what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail specifically about the medications that we use to treat type 2 diabetes. So again, diabetes referring specifically tonight to type 2 only. Um, so this is just a, a timeline to show you how, um, how rapidly the number of diabetes medications that we have available um, has increased over the last several years. So if you look over here, this is 1920. This is when insulin was discovered and this is when it was first produced for the treatment of diabetes. And this was the first pharmacologic treatment of diabetes that became available. And insulin was the only treatment available for many years, over 30 years, until the mid-1950s when a new class of drugs called sulfonylureas were, um, were produced. Um, and then sulfonylureas for the next many years were the only non-insulin class of medications that were available, really until metformin was approved in the United States in the mid-1990s. And then you can see in the mid-1990s and onwards, there's been a very rapid increase in the number of medications that we have available for type 2. Um, this is only non-insulin medications on this, on this graph here and um, also does not include all of those combination pills that some of you might be familiar with. So we have over 30 distinct medications to treat type 2 available at this point. So many, many more than we started with several years ago. Um, so part of the reason why we have so many more medications is because over the years we've learned a lot more about why type 2 diabetes happens and the underlying pathophysiology. So there are multiple different organ systems and hormonal systems that are disrupted that lead to the high blood sugar that characterizes type 2 diabetes. And our different medications target different aspects of these systems. So you don't have to, again, memorize any of this stuff, but this is just to give you a sense of how complicated um, diabetes really is and how our medications fit into this picture. So with this increase in the number of medications that we have, we've also created a lot more questions for ourselves. At meaning, namely, how do we f use all of these different medications? How do, what medications are best for which specific patients? And how do we use them all together in combination? We don't have great answers for that right now because these medications haven't all been around for very long. Right? But the ADA has addressed this in their guidelines over the last several years. And they've come up with lots of different um, very complicated flow sheets and algorithms and charts to try and help us make these decisions for our patients. So this is one from 2015, and it's, again, I'm not memorizing any of this, but just looking at what we're dealing with when we're trying to figure out what medications are best for you. So this was from 2015. This is um, edited for 2017. I think they just changed everything around and reordered it, but it's all basically the same information. Um, um, and then this is this year, this is 2019, so this is what we have right now. Uh, it looks different, right? It's actually, you know, if you are a physician and you don't treat diabetes on a regular basis, it, I think it is fairly helpful. Um, and this really reflects how different patients are. Every patient is, we have a lot of information from clinical trials about the population and about how um, drugs affect um, the population as a whole. Um, but really, the decisions that you're making about your treatment need to be made on an individual basis with your physician. So I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, each of the major classes of medications that we're using currently to treat type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how um, the, the, some of the newer uh, indications for, um, for reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. So um, metformin, Dr. Jelani mentioned, is the first line medication for type 2 diabetes. It's been around a long time. It's safe. It's effective. It's cheap. Um, basically, everybody with type 2 diabetes should be on metformin unless there's a real contraindication or even you just can't tolerate it for whatever. So the way it work prim works primarily is by reducing the amount of glucose that comes out of your liver, right, and thereby reducing the amount of glucose in the blood. So finally, Rias, as I mentioned, is they're the oldest non-insulin class of medications that we have to treat type 2 diabetes. So we have had many, many years of experience with these drugs. Um, so we know that they're safe. We know that they're effective. At this point, they're very cheap, which is its main, their main benefit. Um, they work by increasing the amount of insulin that comes out of your pancreas, out of the insulin-producing cells. Um, some of the, the drawbacks to these drugs are that they, cause low, they can cause low blood sugar and they are associated with weight gain. So neither of things, those things are very good. But if, the, if you're on one of these drugs and it's working for you, that's great. There's nothing wrong with these medications. Um, the TZDs are also an older class of medications at this point, And they work primarily by increasing insulin sensitivity in all of your tissues, including your liver, but also in your peripheral tissues. Um, so your peripheral tissues, meaning your muscle and your fat. 
So if your muscle and fat become more insulin sensitive, they're able to take more glucose out of the bloodstream, um, and blood glucose is then lowered in that fashion. Um, unfortunately, these drugs do have a pretty um, negative side effect profile. They're associated with weight gain, with edema and fluid retention. They're potentially associated with increased risk of fracture. So none of these things are good, and this actually limits um, the utility of these medications. So occasionally, someone may be taking this medication, but we've moved away from these for the most part. These are GLP-1 agonists. Um, these are non-insulin medications, but they're injected in a similar fashion to insulin. So I put this picture up here of the injection just because sometimes if, no, if you haven't had an experience injecting a medication, it can be a little daunting to think about it. But this is actually very easy. The needles are very small, and even people with, who have fear of needles can do this, I promise. And Courtney can also attest to this. We do this every day in our, in our diabetes center. So um, the way that these medications work, um, there's a hormone that is secreted from cells in your intestine called GLP-1. There's also another one that's similar called GIP. And these hormones are secreted from cells in your intestine when you eat food. When, these, when GLP-1 and GIP are secreted, they act on the pancreas to help the pancreas produce more insulin at the time that you're eating the meal. Um, they also work on your stomach to help slow the emptying of the stomach, make you feel full faster. They work on your brain to help you feel full, so they promote satiety. And they promote the signal that that you're getting from your food that you are full and you can stop eating. The nice thing about these uh, medications additionally is that they don't cause low blood sugar. So you, have, you get lose weight, you have no low blood sugar. That's the opposite of a sulfonylurea, right? So these are very good effects. Um, and they're, these, some of the drugs in this class are also associated with a potential cardiovascular benefit. We'll talk about that. DPP4 inhibitors. So these work on the same pathway as the GLP-1 agonists. They work mainly by preventing the breakdown of the GLP-1 hormone that you make on your own. Um, so you get a little bit higher level and you get a little bit more of the effect of increased insulin, a little bit of the satiety, but it's, they're really much less potent than the GLP-1 agonists. Um, they're, nice be, they're convenient because they're orally administered. Um, they have really minimal side effects, um, but you don't get a lot of glucose lowering bang for your buck. And then finally, this is the newest class, SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so these drugs work by um, increasing the amount of extra glucose that is excreted in your urine. So you basically pee out glucose. Um, these are associated with weight loss, which is nice. They are not associated with low blood sugar, which is nice. They lower blood pressure to a small degree, which is useful for many patients with diabetes. Um, and they are also associated with potentially with a cardiovascular benefit. <coughs> So just to put the, so I mentioned now the, the GLP-1 agonists and the SGLT, SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with cardiovascular benefits. So what does that mean? Um, just to put it into context, so Dr. Jelani just gave you a very nice talk about how type 2 patients with type 2 diabetes are um, at a higher cardiovascular risk, much higher than compared to the general population. And this has been a very vexing problem because we don't really have a great way to address that excess risk, right? We know we can control blood pressure, we can control lipids, um, you can and stop smoking, all those things will reduce your cardiovascular risk, but even if you control all of those things, if you have type 2 diabetes, you still are at a higher risk of heart attack and stroke, and we haven't had a great way to address that really up until now. Um, so the, the history behind these trials where we're learning about the cardiovascular benefits of these medications uh, is that in 2007, there was a paper published uh, about the, the medication rosiglitazone, which is a Vandia, which is one of the TZDs that it's still available, but most people aren't prescribing it now. Um, and this paper suggested that it was associated with a, with a substantially increased risk of, of heart attack in patients with diabetes who were receiving it. Um, so th obviously this is problematic to give a medication that increases heart attack risk, people who are already at a higher risk of heart attacks, right? So basically, every medication that's coming out now has to go through, go through one of these big trials. So over the next 10 years, 15 of these trials were completed, um, and these included um, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And this is a lot of work, right? Each drug needs its own trial. There's thousands of patients involved, lots and lots of money. Um, <clears throat> and so just to note also about these trials, they're performed in, patient, in subjects with known cardiovascular disease or have particularly high cardiovascular risk in addition to having diabetes. Uh, and that's just because in order to generate the results in a, in a reasonable amount of time, you need to have patients who are likely to have events. So um, we have results from these trials, but they can't necessarily be extrapolated to patients who are at lower cardiovascular 
disease risk, just to know. Um, so just to review which specific agents have been shown to have a cardiovascular benefit, these are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so empagliflozin, which is, you may know as Jardians, has been shown to reduce um, what is referred to as MACE, as major adverse cardiac events. That refers to um, a composite endpoint of non-fatal heart attack, non-fatal stroke, and cardiovascular death. So if you look at all three of those things together, reduce uh, the incidence of, of bad cardiovascular events in the patients who were taking the medication. And it was actually, the result was particularly driven by a, a significant reduction in cardiovascular death. So people who took Jardians died less, which is a really nice outcome. Um, so actually, Jardians was the first medication to, to specifically get a label on it from the FDA that it was indicated to reduce the, the chance of cardiac death, cardiovascular death with type 2 diabetes. So this is actually a big breakthrough because it's one of the first drugs that we've had specifically um, for that indication. Um, canagliflozin, which you may know is Invokana, also has been shown to reduce uh, major adverse cardiac events, but maybe not quite as strongly as empagliflozin, Jardians. Um, and dapagliflozin, which is Farsiga, has been shown to reduce the incidence of heart failure hospitalizations. So all these things are positive. Um, GLP-1 agonists also have been shown to have the same, similar cardiovascular benefits. Um, liraglutide, which you might know as Victoza, um, has similarly reduced major adverse cardiac events and cardiovascular death, and similarly got a label indication on it that it is indicated for um, reduction of cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. Tanzian had a um, demonstrated cardiac, uh, cardiovascular benefit in the trial, but this has been discontinued. Um, it's taken off the market, not for anything bad, because they just weren't selling enough of it, I think. Um, and then dilaglutide, which is Trulicity, um, we don't have the results of that, their cardiovascular outcomes trial yet, but it will be released in a couple of months, so we'll hear more about that soon. Okay. So that brings me back to our 2019 flow sheet for how we choose what medications you're going to take for your diabetes. Um, so if you actually, on this side, this is the side that emphasizes that if you have known cardiovascular disease, you really should be on one of these medications, GLP-1 agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is brand new, right, as of this year. Um, otherwise, it's still an individual conversation you need to have with your doctor uh, about what your preferences are and what your priorities are and what's going to work best for you. So just to summarize, there has been an, an explosion in the number of medications available for the treatment of type 2 diabetes over the last 20 years. And some of these medications, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, are associated with reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events in high-risk patients specifically. We're not sure what, hap what the benefit is in someone who doesn't have cardiovascular disease. We think it's probably positive, but how positive, it's hard to say if that's going to outweigh um, other factors in your decision making about what medications you should take. Um, so because this is all fairly new information, it's appropriate at this point to ask your doctor if your current regimen is the one that works, is the best for you. Right? We have new drugs that do things that we didn't could do before in terms of reducing your cardiovascular risk. So if you've had diabetes a long time and you're on an older regimen, it might be a good time to talk about updating. 